The guessing game about Pelosi's plans ended with this late night touchdown in Taipei. The House Speaker was greeted by local officials, even hailed with a welcome message on Taiwan's tallest skyscraper. But across the narrow Taiwan Strait, China responded, announcing new live-fire military drills encircling Taiwan and warning that the U.S. would pay the price for undermining China's interests. The speaker has the right to visit Taiwan. Here in Washington, the administration offered cautious backing for the trip, but they weren't always so supportive. Well, I, I, I think that... The military thinks it's not a good idea right now. To reduce tensions, Speaker Pelosi's flight path from Malaysia took her away from the Chinese mainland and the South China Sea. Her journey was tracked by nearly three million people online. I believe she has every right to go. You do not want the Chinese Communist Party dictating to senior American leaders where they can and cannot travel. Pelosi isn't the first lawmaker to visit Taiwan this year. But she's the first House Speaker to do so in 25 years. And she's been a thorn in China's side since 1991, when she unfurled a pro-democracy banner in Beijing's Tiananmen Square. In an op-ed today, Pelosi said she made the trip because, quote, we cannot stand by as China proceeds to threaten Taiwan. What is this going to do to the U.S.-China relationship, which is already so fraught? We don't want to see this spiral into any kind of a crisis or conflict. We want to be able to maintain those lines of communication. It's going to depend a lot on how China behaves uh, over coming days and weeks. China is holding a series of unprecedented live fire drills in protest at the controversial visit to self-rule Taiwan by U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Today, our delegation, of which I'm very proud, came to Taiwan to make unequivocally clear we will not abandon our commitment to Taiwan and we are proud of our enduring friendship. These drills include missile tests and what's called other military operations, some to be carried out within Taiwan's territorial waters. In the next three days, both air and sea traffic in the area are barred effectively blockading Taiwan, which Beijing views as a breakaway province. China is accusing the U.S. of undermining Beijing's One China policy. The Chinese military's conducting of drills in the sea near China's Taiwan are a necessary and just measure to resolutely protect national sovereignty and territorial integrity. In response to the major provocative moves by some U.S. politicians and Taiwan independence forces. China's temper has been tested. Beijing unleashing a barrage of ballistic missiles towards Taiwan. Its biggest drills in the Taiwan Strait yet, a day after US House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited the island in solidarity. It's been flooding across that line with its aircraft and its ships over the last uh, 48 hours. Originally, there were six uh, military zones where China was operating its live firing around Tai... Um, Taiwan. Now it's seven. Now, well, we understand it's now seven. Uh, another one out, uh, out to the east. They've also been, Chinese have been operating uh, drones around Kinmen Islands, which are only five miles away from the Chinese mainland. There's been uh, 11 ballistic missiles launched by China into these zones, some of them flying across the top of Taiwan. China's claimed all of those have hit their targets, but in reality, they're firing them into the, the sea. sea. So it's very difficult to tell. Interestingly, they've also fired five ballistic missiles into the Japanese economic zone, which is quite provocative. Japan is Pelosi's last stop on her Asian tour, where officials say five of the missiles had landed in the country's exclusive economic zone. We believe this is the first time Chinese missiles have fallen within Japan's exclusive economic zone. Meeting with Japan's PM, the two committed to upholding stability in the Taiwan Strait. The Chinese have tried to isolate Taiwan. The speaker, defiant amid criticism, her trip to Taiwan was provocative. We will not allow them to isolate Taiwan. They are not doing our travel schedule. We're going to speak up and speak out for human rights, human dignity and de democratic process. Yeah, the, well, those punitive measures are being directed at the United States now. 
So just moments ago, China announced that it's cutting off talks with the U.S. in various areas. So these are high-level phone calls in the military, exchanges in defense and maritime affairs, cross-border crime, drug trafficking, and even discussions on climate change. Uh, Speaker Pelosi herself is uh, being shut out by the Chinese. The foreign ministry said that she and her immediate family are going to be sanctioned, although no specifics on what that actually means. Uh, Taiwan, as well as its companies, continue to face the fallout of Pelosi's visit. Uh, the Chinese state media say that they have sent in over two, over 100 warplanes and 10 warships to the area. And uh, they also had said that they had fired off multiple missiles. The United States will not be provoked. We'll continue to do what we've done for a long time. We'll support cross-strait peace and stability and a free and open Indo-Pacific. You'll see that in the days and weeks ahead. We will stick by our allies and partners and work with and through regional organizations to enable friends in the region to make their own decisions free from coercion. We'll take further steps to demonstrate our commitment to the security of our allies in the region including Japan. We will fly, sail, and operate wherever international law allows. We'll continue to conduct standard air and maritime transits through the Taiwan Strait, consistent with our longstanding approach to working with allies and partners to uphold freedom of navigation and overflight, which has enabled the region's prosperity for many decades. <laughs> Okay, we see it going on. The world is spiraling into chaos and moving into the new phase, clearly. We have spoken about this on this channel, and the warnings around the conflict between the United States and China have been spoken about numerous times. If you have followed this channel, you should have a decent expectation of the conflict that is arising, and that will be a leading factor in the world change required in order to create this coming new world order. This is inevitable, and it is coming. But if you watch this video, you should have a strong understanding that none of this can occur until the Most High, Yahuwah, has said so, and the second seal has been opened. So while many were anxious, waiting to see what transpired from Pelosi visiting Taiwan, we know that what happens in this world is in Yah's hand, regardless of how wicked these people are and how much control they have over the earth. It's all in Yah's timing, and that is always important to remember. But as these events transpire, it can all be very deceiving. Depending on where we are in this world, we are only able to receive the narrative that they want us to believe in. And though we have an ultimate understanding of where all this conflict is taking the world, what we do not understand is how. We see the United States consistently provoking confrontation all over the world. We will not abandon our commitment to Taiwan and we were proud of our enduring friendship. And we also see these other countries taking them on and not backing down. We understand that it's all leading to a new world order, but we do not understand how fully scripted and controlled it really is. This phase of the agenda leading to this new world order is all a part of the geopolitical reset of the overall Great Reset, a subject that was spoken about in depth in another video. But for believers, it is important to not be led in their narratives and to really grasp what is occurring in this world. So this geopolitical reset that is being narrated by the two main actors of the United States and China needs to be understood outside of the main narrative of the world stage. Reality needs to break in to help guide your heart and mind as the rest of the world is driven into fear, chaos, and collapse. Let's begin. Okay, so I could discuss this topic from a current worldview, going over what we are all seeing on the news and what we are not seeing. 
It's easy to give out a summary of what is going on and say the conflict between the United States and China will occur because it will collapse the world system and lead the world into the new change. But what you may say is, this channel says that about everything. And really, what if the US and China really are just moving an unintentional conflict and has nothing to do with the new world order? Well, the first part is to understand this from the understanding around the Great Reset. You see, how everything is framed in the minds of the general public is that China is attacking the current status quo, trying to be the leaders of the new world order after the fall of the United States. People want to believe that this is all about China replacing the role of the United States as leader. And this view allows an easier understanding for a person to look at these geopolitical events from. But this is not the reality and what is desired in this part of the reset. As I said, what is happening between these two nations is all about the geopolitical reset that is a part of the Great Reset. In his book, COVID-19, The Great Reset, Klaus Schwab, founder of the World Economic Forum, speaks in detail about the geopolitical reset that will occur in this world. On page 105 of the book, he says, if no one power can enforce order, our world will suffer from a global order deficit. Unless individual nations and international organizations succeed in finding solutions to better collaborate at the global level, we risk entering an age of entropy in which retrenchment, fragmentation, anger, parochialism will increasingly define our global landscape, making it less intelligible and more disorderly. Yeah, he used a lot of words, but he's basically explaining that if no one power can enforce the order today, we will suffer from what he calls as a global order deficit. And he feels the only solution is for individual nations and international organizations finding a better way to collaborate at the global level. And that is the synopsis of the geopolitical reset. An international organization will have to bring order after we have disorder and chaos from a lack of leadership from those we see as world powers. On that same page, he writes, four main issues that will become more prevalent in the post-pandemic era and that conflate with each other, the erosion of globalization, the absence of global governance, the increasing rivalry between the United States and China, and the fate of fragile and failing states. So in this discussion, we don't need to focus on the erosion of globalization, as this is easily seen as showing that nationalism, like the doctrine of Donald Trump, does not work. And speaking of the fate of fragile and failing states is easily seen today, as we see so many nations in chaos. Both of those issues go directly to the geopolitical reset. But the two main issues you want to understand is the absence of global governance, which very soon in this video, you'll be able to see that they believe that reversing this will be the solution and the outcome of this geopolitical reset. And you also want to take note that the rivalry between the United States and China is what is highlighted as the major issue for this reset. Not with Ukraine and Russia, not Israel and Iran or any other conflict. This is the main geopolitical conflict that will lead to this geopolitical reset. Now, in reference to global governance, on page 114, Schwab defines global governance as the process of cooperation among transnational actors aimed at providing responses to global problems, those that affect more than one state or region. It encompasses the totality of institutions, policies, norms, procedures, and initiatives through which nation states try to bring more predictability and stability to their responses to transnational challenges. Now, that's just a lot of words to just say a process to solve international problems that deals with the total governing of the world system. He said that the UN says the effective global governance can only be achieved with effective international cooperation. And put bluntly, we live in a world in which nobody is really in charge. 
And this is the simple understanding to what the outcome of this geopolitical reset will consist of. It simply will be some international organization being in charge of the world. On page 115, he wrote, Therefore, the concern is that without appropriate global governance, we will become paralyzed in our attempts to address and respond to global challenges. And this is a major worry, considering that today there is no committee to save the world. So summing up the problem in this current system that needs to be reset, there is no committee or organization to save the world. And he noted this in an example how during the pandemic, each individual nation had their own solution to the virus and there was not a world coordinated response. Global governance will change this and this will be the outcome of the geopolitical reset. And this leadership will not be placed in the role of the United States, who is the leader of this current world order, nor will it be China, who is the main rival to the leader of the current world order. And that's why understanding the global governance is important. Now, the increasing rivalry between the United States and China is just the main narrative and scapegoat that will be used to bring about this global governance outcome of the geopolitical reset. As he said in the book on page 119, after 40 years of strategic engagement, the U.S. and China now seem unable to bridge the ideological and political divides that separate them. Far from uniting the two geopolitical giants, the pandemic did the exact opposite by exacerbating their rivalry and intensifying competition between them. And then at the end of this discussion on this issue, he basically explained that the real lesson here is not that the U.S. is finished and China is going to be the dominant power of the 21st century. I think the reality is that all the superpowers, the United States, the People's Republic of China, and the European Union have been exposed as highly dysfunctional. Being big, as the proponents of this idea argue, entails diseconomies of scale. Countries or empires have grown so large as to reach a threshold beyond which they cannot effectively govern themselves. And so what we should come to expect is that the conflict and rivalry between the United States and China will lead to a loss of leadership in the world. And at the end of all this chaos, we will see the geopolitical system reset itself. Now, Klaus Schwab also wrote a book after the Great Reset entitled The Great Narrative for a Better Future. And in this book, he also discusses geopolitics in regards to the overall narrative. On page 75 of the book, he writes, The rising and seemingly intractable rivalry between China and the United States represents the greatest geopolitical concern of our times for two reasons. One, the rivalry has the potential to generate global repercussions on an unprecedented scale and in a multiplicity of domains. And two, no global issue can be significantly addressed without a modicum of cooperation between the two rivals. As a result, the geopolitical landscape will suffer from a global order deficit. For all these reasons, in the years to come, the quality of the relationship between China and the United States will be the overpowering factor determining most of the global outcome, geopolitically of course, but in other areas as well. And hopefully by hearing all this, you really understand the point of why we are seeing this conflict grow increasingly unstable. This is by design and it's being used to reset the geopolitical structure of this world towards global governance. And this conflict will increase until the chaos occurs that produces the order that they desire. Now, I clearly show this from a standpoint from a major world player, Klaus Schwab, who is the founder of the World Economic Forum. This is an organization that is a think tank for the nations of the world. But because China is so isolated and no one really understands what is truly going on with them internally, maybe you may question if they are part of this agenda or they're just being used without knowledge. I think this is important to understand because once understood, it can truly assist you with understanding how controlled and guided this world really is. China is fully a part of this world agenda and guided and steered by the same powers that have guided this world into all of its modern wars and has been the unseen hand 
leading the world towards this new world order. As I showed in the first part of the Breaking Out of the Matrix series, we have to follow the money. And once we do, it is very easy to see the hand that has been guiding this rivalry. The Communist People's Republic of China did not just appear on the world stage by itself by making the right moves. It was carefully created and guided and then brought in. And then after its official entrance on the world stage, after 50 years, it has now been made ready to be the main rival that can help lead the world into the next stage of the geopolitical agenda. When really trying to understand this world, there's a part of mainstream history that is not given to the masses that believers should have when you're trying to really understand what is going on in geopolitics. In our modern day system, there has been an unseen hand guiding the ways of this world. For more than two centuries, the Rothschilds have ranked among the world's most famous, distinguished, and wealthiest families. It is not an overstatement to say that the family members were the richest people ever to live. As we seek to understand what has gone on behind the scenes in this world, if you do not understand or consider their influence, you will never understand the present world and what is occurring. To better understand China, you cannot gain this understanding without understanding the Rothschild's influence. It is not a secret, it's just hidden in plain sight that the Rothschild family has been doing business in China since the early 19th century in the 1830s. As on their Rothschild company website, they explain, the Rothschild's family businesses can trace their first contact with China to the 1830s. Our business was one of the first Western business institutions to re-establish relations after 1953. We have direct access to the Chinese and North Asian markets through our local Chinese bankers who are based on the ground in Shanghai, Beijing, and Hong Kong and supported by a partnership in South Korea. We command an in-depth knowledge of the region's economic development and the challenges facing its industries and have developed an exceptional understanding of the local regulatory and market environment. Our team is skilled at bridging the cultural gaps that can exist between the managements of foreign and local companies and are the leading advisor to Chinese companies investing in Europe. Now, for a country that appears to be so isolated from the West, one that has a communist regime in charge of all aspects of the country, this connection is a little odd. So we should dig a little deeper. When the Rothschilds conducted their first cooperation with the Middle Kingdom, which is China, in 1838, it was under the reign of the Guan. I don't know if I said that right. The seventh emperor of the Qing dynasty. After suffering the defeat from Western powers in the Opium Wars, China had to open various treaty ports along its coast for international trade. This event brought fundamental and long-lasting changes to the Chinese monetary and banking system, coming from the simultaneous establishment of Western merchant houses and later banks that engaged in money exchange and trade finance. Basically, the Opium Wars allowed the West into China and the power of the world at the time was held by the Rothschild dynasty. The first firm evidence of official interaction between the Rothschilds and China dates from 1838 and the earliest surviving letters from the Rothschilds agents in Canton. It is said that the family was interested in the trade of silks feature alongside tin, tea, coconut, quicksilver, and other commodities in a place on the earth that was pretty much untapped but full of activity. As the Rothschilds do, they appointed an agent Jardine, Matheson, and company to act as its eyes and ears in that once impenetrable market. After the Anglo-Chinese treaties of 1842 and 1858, which ended the Opium Wars, the Rothschilds moved to expand the Chinese links, taking on new agents focusing mainly on the trade of silver. For evidence of this early relationship, shown from the Rothschild archive, here is a gift given to Charles Rothschild from the Chinese Kuang Su Official Bank. Now, at the end of the 19th century, 
one of the Rothschild banks in Asia, Hong Kong Bank, had a successful rise. At the end of the century, Hong Kong Bank became virtually two banks. It was an exchange bank in the East and a merchant bank in London. And this led to the accord on China loans between Hong Kong Bank and Deutsche Asiatic Bank in 1895. And then Hong Kong Bank agreed that if it needed help in placing a China loan in London, it would offer the business first to Rothschilds. Now, in case you don't recognize the name Hong Kong Bank, you may recognize it by its current name, the Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation Limited, commonly known as HSBC. Yeah, what I am sharing here is that the Rothschild dynasty already had an existing banking relationship in this Asian region, specifically in China and Japan, before the People's Republic of China ever existed. These business dealings were public. What was done in private is not easily as known. Now, long story short, the Qing dynasty, who the Rothschilds started their business relationship with, this dynasty collapsed, and then China fell into turmoil. There was a fight for power over some decades, and eventually the Chinese Nationalist Party unified China in 1928. They were now in control. And China was divided by the growing influence of the Chinese Communist Party. Now, one thing that is not clear or confirmed is the hand that the Rothschilds played in bringing communism into China and how they supported the rise of Mao Zedong. Now, this is not documented, but the list of the associations make things quite clear when you know of their involvement in so many other endeavors in this world. You see, communism is a product of Karl Marx and his communist manifesto. Now, it's easily asked, how did this doctrine even make it into China? But whatever. It is a proven fact that Karl Marx shares a common ancestor of the Rothschild's bloodline. As you see from this family tree, Barrett Cohen of Amsterdam is a relative of both Nathan Meyer, First Lord Rothschild, and also of Karl Marx. Karl Marx's communist doctrine was able to be spread because it was a product backed by the Rothschilds. It is claimed that this communist doctrine always had the aim of creating a revolution that would redefine reality in terms of the interests of these international bankers. These ideologies that we know as socialism, liberalism, fascism, neoconservatism, Zionism, and feminism are all modern isms, and they are all fronts for communism, which is all organized and funded by the central banking cartel. It is claimed that Mao Zedong, was a product of the Rothschilds. In 1903, Yale Divinity School established a number of schools and hospitals throughout China that were collectively known as Yale in China. It has been said that Yale in China was an intelligence network whose purpose was to destroy the Republican movement of Sun Yat-sen on behalf of the Anglo-American establishment. The Anglo-American establishment hated Sun because he wanted to develop China apparently without the backing of the Rothschild banking system, which we see is common when we understand world history and how things happen in other countries as well. It is said one of Yale and China's most important students was Mao Zedong. During World War II, Yale and China was a primary instrument used by the US establishment and its Office of Strategic Services, OSS, to install the Maoist in power. Yale in China was run by OSS operative Reuben Holden, the husband of Bush's cousin and also a member of Skull and Bones, which is from Yale. And after much conflict between Japan and then the Chinese Nationalist Party, on October 1st, 1949, Mao Zedong declares the founding of the People's Republic of China in Tiananmen Square. Beijing, who was funded by Rothschilds and led by Rothschild agent Solomon Adler, who was an economist who worked in the United States Treasury Department. He served as Treasury representative in China during World War II. After several years teaching at Cambridge University in England, he returned to China in the 1950s and was a resident there from the 1960s until his death, working as a translator, economic advisor, and possibly with the Central External Liaison Department, a Chinese intelligence agency. 
And from this, we see the rise of the People's Republic of China and the Central Bank, the People's Bank of China. So in examining this history, what you will see is that there was a constant influence of the Rothschild banking dynasty and the rise of the Communist People's Republic of China was intentional. Now, after you understand that influence and how the rise of China's Communist Party began, it then gets very interesting. For the public, China has been outcasted from the international community. But then it was publicly made known that in 1953, the Rothschilds were amongst the first foreign institutions to re-establish connections with the communist regime after the Korean War, with dealings consisting primarily of gold trading with the Bank of China. But then we have what they call the week that changed the whole world. On July 15, 1971, President Nixon requested time on national TV. The announcement I shall now read is being issued simultaneously in Peking and in the United States. Knowing of President Nixon's expressed desire to visit the People's Republic of China, Premier Cho Enlai, on behalf of the government of the People's Republic of China, has extended an invitation to President Nixon to visit China. The effect was electric. The idea was almost unimaginable. The Washington Post said, if Mr. Nixon had revealed he was going to the moon, he could not have flabbergasted his world audience more. The Cold War was raging. In Southeast Asia, China was North Vietnam's ally, and Richard Nixon's credentials as an anti-communist were longstanding and impeccable. But in the fall of 1967, Nixon wrote a seminal article about Asia after Vietnam. Taking the long view, he wrote, we simply cannot afford to leave China forever outside the family of nations. There is no place on this small planet for a billion of its potentially most able people to live in angry isolation. In January 1969, in his first inaugural address, President Nixon confirmed his determination to change America's policy toward China. We seek an open world a world in which no people, great or small, will live in angry isolation. On February 17, 1972, after two years of secret and delicate negotiations, the President and First Lady were on their way to China. Then a month later, Nixon removes the dollar off the gold standard. The principal element in building the new prosperity is closely related to creating new jobs and halting inflation. We must protect the position of the American dollar as a pillar of monetary stability around the world. Accordingly, I have directed the Secretary of the Treasury to take the action necessary to defend the dollar against the speculators. None of this is coincidence. Now, all of that is well known. What is not known is about the power behind the scenes. In the book, The Rockefellers, An American Dynasty by Peter Collier and David Horowitz, they speak about David Rockefeller, grandson of John D. Rockefeller, and at the time, chairman of Chase Manhattan Bank, and a very important man to all of this. On page 407, when speaking about David, they write, Among the powerful, the Chase Manhattan Bank ranked very near the top. At the time, David was deciding to turn down Nixon's offer of the Treasury Post. He chaired a board of directors interlocked with the boards of Allied Chemical, Exxon, Standard of Indiana, Shell Oil, AT&T, Honeywell, General Foods, and dozens of other corporate giants. Chase was a leading stockholder in CBS, Jersey Standard, Atlantic Richfield, United Airlines, and a galaxy of other corporations from AT&T and IBM to Motorola and Safeway. The power the stockholding position conferred was immense. Yeah, it was immense. So the Chase Manhattan Bank was the leading stockholder of these companies, giving them the most say about what happens with these corporations. And David Rockefeller was the chairman of Chase, along with the chairman of a board of directors of other major companies. Companies that, for the most part, all exist today in power, I might add. So I explain all this to show the power and control that this one man had. But on page 429 of the book, they explained, David was also looking farther east. On March 5th, 1971, 
he told a select group of European businessmen meeting in Rome that there must be more U.S. trade with the Soviet and especially the Chinese governments, and that the Iron Curtain must be replaced with a plate glass curtain. Four days later, he told a financial forum in Singapore, organized by the Chase, that it was unrealistic for the United States to act as if a country of 800 million people did not exist. And he said that we must establish contacts with the People's Republic of China. Do you see how he's speaking about what the United States should do? <laughs> it should also be noted that David Rockefeller was offered the position of Treasury Secretary of the United States at the same time when Nixon was taking the dollar off the gold standard. But David did not need to be so open in the limelight, especially being that he had Henry Kissinger a part of Nixon's cabinet. Henry Kissinger himself made a couple secret trips to China to work on the relationship with China, and he was present when Nixon went there. And shortly after we had that announcement from Nixon, in his book, David Rockefeller's Memoirs, on page 242, chapter 18, Penetrating the Bamboo Curtain, he writes, Late in the evening of June 29th, 1973, Barely a month after the opening of Chase's Moscow office, Peggy and I sat in the Great Hall of the People in Beijing, talking with Premier Zhao Enlai, a man second in rank and power only to Mao Zedong. This was my first trip to China, and it was a historic one, as I was the first American banker to visit the People's Republic of China. That afternoon, I had signed an agreement that made Chase the first U.S. correspondent bank of the Bank of China since the communist takeover 23 years earlier. Yeah, so then we already saw the Rothschild connection, but later on, after the establishment of the Communist Party of China, then we see David Rockefeller was the first American banker to visit the People's Republic of China. There are no coincidences here. Now, after Nixon went to China, he made a joint declaration with China, which is known as the Shanghai Communique, 1972. And in this declaration, it was stated, the two sides reviewed the long-standing serious disputes between China and the United States. The Chinese side reaffirmed its position. The Taiwan question is the crucial question obstructing the normalization of relations between China and the United States. The government of the People's Republic of China is the sole legal government of China. Taiwan is a province of China, which has long been returned to the motherland. The liberation of Taiwan is China's internal affair in which no other country has the right to interfere. And all U.S. forces and military installations must be withdrawn from Taiwan. The Chinese government firmly opposes any activities which aim at the creation of one China, one Taiwan, one China, two governments, two Chinas, an independent Taiwan, or advocate that. The status of Taiwan remains to be determined. And this was in 1972 they made this. And so therefore, we have the premise here of the narrative that we are seeing unfolding today. Fifty years later, it is being played out and escalated and seems as if it's just a part of modern geopolitics. But when understanding truly how the world works from the inside, we can see things are much deeper than they actually appear. There are so many other pieces to all this. The history runs deep, and it's all hidden right in plain sight. The unseen hand is run through international financiers, international bankers that fund wars, revolutions, and full national economies. And this influence has never decreased. These international bankers were always intertwined with Chinese companies. They rebuilt the whole way China's economy was to work. And the point I'm making is that they developed this current superpower. China did not just do this on their own. What we see in China is not a mistake, but it has been very intentional. The unseen hand of this world had their hands and influence completely on China and helped them develop as a rival to the United States, all in order to bring about the new world order that is on the way. You can be blinded by the media and false narratives being presented, and you can see the conflict that they are pursuing. But as a believer, 
you should know that this is all part of the same coin being promoted by the unseen hand of international bankers that control the world behind the scenes. When I started this video, before going into the history of China and going into their connections with the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers, I first went into discussing this topic by explaining the current narrative that they are using towards this great reset. I wanted you to understand their game and the agenda. This is the narrative that they're speaking on and promoting. And when it all goes down and documentaries and history books are written, this is how the story will be told. All the narrative from what we see in the mainstream media. But the behind the scenes, what is really happening is not known. You must know and understand just how connected and controlled the world really is. You must understand this information isn't hidden, it's right there in plain sight. But because of our education system and so many other distractions, the majority is just not trained or desire to look into it this far. But make no mistake, everything we see is controlled and orchestrated, and it's leading to an inevitable controlled conflict. They are just waiting for the seals of revelation to be lifted. You cannot allow yourself to be caught up in the politics and all the propaganda, regardless of the side. I do follow their narratives just so I can show people without intimate understanding of these topics how serious these things are according to the narratives that these people are promoting. But I do not believe in, nor do I trust the wicked. You really need to understand what time it is in this world and make sure you understand what you must do. Yahusha has explained it to us. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Yahusha answered and said to him, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. That's Matthew chapter 24, verses 3 through 8. You see, we are at the beginning of sorrows. And you must understand your only source is Yah. You must submit to him and come under his covering. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his master made ruler over his household, to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, My master is delaying his coming, and begins to beat his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunkards. The master of the servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him, and at an hour that he is not aware of, and will cut him in two, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's Matthew chapter 24, verses 45 to 51. So listen, understand, what we all are seeing is concerning, yes. All this conflict is escalating, and it seems that the world is moving towards chaos. Yes, it is. But from this information, you must understand it is controlled and intentional, all for spiritual purposes that are not spoken of. As you see the world moving towards this conflict, be like Yahusha says, and be a faithful and wise servant. Make sure when he comes, he will find you serving and being faithful and submitted to his will. I honestly don't know what else he needs to show everyone to get their attention. But for you, please don't make this so hard. We are at the beginning of sorrows. Look at all this. As these times escalate, you do not want to be found evil in the eyes of Yah. Hopefully with this info, your eyes are open and your heart is given to Yahusha. There is nothing greater in your life that deserves more of your attention than making sure that you are aligned to Yah. Make sure in these last days that you are. Make him 
your priority today. Be blessed. Hallelujah. Praise Yah. Okay. Thanks again for watching. If this has blessed you, please don't forget to like this and share it with others. If you have not done so already, please do not forget to subscribe to this channel. Elohim willing, I upload every Friday. Don't forget to follow this ministry on Facebook and Instagram, as well as on my website, truthunedited.com. As always, I would really like to thank all those who support this ministry. You know who you are. Your contributions have been an extreme blessing to this ministry, and I'm very thankful for you. Thank you for being a blessing and your continued support to this mission. Okay. Thanks again, everyone, for watching. I love you all.